My master, Sauron the Great, bids thee welcome. Sauron, the Dark Lord, had a lot of hideous and scary creatures in his arsenal of allies. However, the most uncanny of them all was not an orc, he was a man, and that man was the one we know as Mouth of Sauron. The closest and most loyal general of Sauron's posse is a sight to behold whenever he shows up, whether on screen or on paper. Today in this video, we will dive deep into the Mouth of Sauron and learn everything about him. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. I have a token I was bidden to show thee. Human or not, who is Mouth of Sauron? From which culture does he belong? While the title Mouth of Sauron might give an impression that the thing we're talking about is a huge mouth, just like Sauron's huge flaming eye, in actuality, he is Sauron's trusted mouthpiece. The impact that Sauron had on readers by never coming out and conversing and simply directing via his mouth was what made him so iconic and surely the one he chose as his mouth is just as iconic. So first things first, he is a man. Actually, he is one of the Numenorians. Now I know what you're wondering, how did a Numenorian end up in Sauron's team? Well, let me tell you all about it. So in the Second Age, the power and knowledge of Numenorians started growing significantly. They knew that they were mortal, so they started wondering what they could do with their power and knowledge. They started going through a sort of existential crisis, wanting to know what their purpose truly was. The more the days went by, the more Numenorians started fearing death, as one does. I mean, don't we all have those moments where we wonder what we would do with whatever we have given when we know we will all die eventually? So with that thought in our heads, the Numenorians started to become envious of the elves. I mean, the elves are practically immortal in their eyes. While it is true that elves can die from grief and violence, at least they don't die of old age as Numenorians do. So the men of Numenor started to wish for a way to escape death. This envy they had for the elves was not something the elves didn't know about. The elves tried their best to explain to the Numenorians that death is a gift and that they should cherish this gift that Iluvatar had given them. But the Numenorians, they felt like this was just the elves flexing their boons that they got by being so close to Iluvatar. This obviously started causing a shift amongst the Numenorians regarding how they felt toward the one god, and the elves told them that losing faith in Iluvatar would be heretical. Despite their pleas and warnings, by the time the year 2221 rolled around and Tar on Kaliman took the throne as king of Numenor, the vast majority of the people started breaking away from the loyalty that their forefathers had for Eru and the Valar. So when Sauron strolled into Numenor, he found free real estate with all of the king's men who had become very anti-Valar and anti-Eru by this time. Corrupting these people and adding them to his own camp was an easy thing for Sauron, the master manipulator. Things took a rather drastic turn when Ar Farazan, the elderly king of Numenor, made it clear that he was super duper scared of old age and eventually dying. This gave Sauron even more grounds to go to him and persuade the old king that everything Valar had told him about Iluvatar was a lie. Sauron warmed the king up to the idea of Morgoth and how worshipping Morgoth would solve all his issues, and the old king fell for it. He started worshipping Morgoth and eventually the entirety of Numenor followed suit. The doctrine quickly spread from the island of Numenor to the colonies of Numenorian men present all over Middle-earth, giving Morgoth's cult a rather strong hold. While these people didn't quite thrive on the main island, they flourished like fungi in the Middle-earth colony, especially in Umbar following the destruction of Numenor. They started to go against the faithful, who we know came from the kings of Arnor and Gondor. They remained fairly loyal to Sauron, and this is when they started to be tagged as Black Numenorians. There were these nine super powerful Numenorians known as the Ringwraiths, right? Three of these Wingwraiths were corrupted by Sauron, and they were enslaved to Sauron's will. Their tenure as Sauron's slave started roughly a thousand years before the downfall of Numenor, so you can understand just how long Sauron had been exercising his powers and spreading evil amongst these people. 
Now, given that these black Numenorians worshipped Morgoth, there was a significant rise of black arts, dark magic, and follies among them, which made the division of the king's men clearer. Only a few king's men remained who were still faithful to Iluvatar. Now, after the fall of Numenor, these faithful Numenorians, known as the Elendili, who managed to survive the destruction, moved to the north of Umbar where they settled down. The black Numenorians held quite a low opinion of these Numenorians, and the feeling was mutual. The black Numenorians of Umbar survived for more than a thousand years after the fall of Numenor and maintained a stronghold and influence in Harad. They were defeated when Gondor rose to power in the Third Age. But it's no secret that there were some black Numenorians who survived that as well. Like Queen Beruthiel was a notable black Numenorian herself. Now why did I go on a tangent about the black Numenorians? Well, that's because the Mouth of Sauron is actually one such black Numenorian. He was one of the many black Numenorians who started living in the Middle-earth when Sauron started rising in power. In the year 2951, when Sauron's Dark Tower first rose in power, that's when the Mouth entered his services. The Mouth's history is definitely far longer than that, but barely anything is known about him. Even his name is forgotten by everyone, including himself. He started off as a loyal black Numenorian under Sauron's commands, but he quickly rose in ranks when he proved time and time again that he was cunning, cruel, and a quick learner when it came to sorcery. All of these things were good traits that made him favorable in Sauron's eyes. The Mouth became favored by the Dark Lord, and eventually rose to prominence when he was made the lieutenant of the Tower of Barad-dûr. Given he was crueler than orcs, I believe that's why the Dark Lord chose the Mouth to be his messenger, his voice. Being of Numenorean descent, he was not just a crude slave to Sauron's commands like the orcs were. This meant that he was valuable for his counsel and as a strategist. While he may or may not have been a muscle goon for Sauron, he was definitely a politically minded chieftain to his cause, and that contributed to his value as an asset for the Dark Lord's plans. He knew that the Mouth would wreak havoc wherever he went with just a simple command, and that was not something Sauron was going to pass on. So, thanks to all of these traits and the rich history of his people, the Mouth of Sauron became the Mouth and started carrying out Sauron's bidding for him. The Mouth is the only one who was allowed to use Sauron's elvish name, which goes on to prove just how close these two were. Besides, it's also quite probable that he was the so-called questioner involved in the torture and interrogation of Gollum, when the agents of Barad-dûr had captured him in order to learn the whereabouts of the One Ring. But as we know, by that time, the ruling ring had passed on from poor Smeagol's hands into Bilbo Baggins' possession. Speaking of the events of The Hobbit, did you know that he may have appeared as Sauron's emissary at the foot of Mount Erebor in the years right before the War of the Ring? He was sent to inquire about the creature Baggins from the Shire, which was the only bit of information they had managed to pry from Gollum about the One Ring. In exchange for the information, and additionally if the dwarves managed to deliver the One Ring to Sauron, they were promised the return of three rings of power that belonged to the dwarf lords of old, along with the control of the mines of Moria that they had lost ages ago. They were warned, however, that the consequences for choosing not to comply would be grim. The king of the Lonely Mountain at this time, Dane II, knew better than to trust Sauron and sent away the messenger by saying that he needed more time to think about the proposal. So rather than being bribed or blackmailed, the king chose his allies prudently by deciding to send Glowin to the Council of Elrond and preparing the Lonely Mountain for the eventual war that would be upon them. So in short, instead of outright telling the mouth, no, the dwarves did the tactical move of, I will think about it and let you know, which I personally found quite amusing. Behind his mask, what does he look like? I think what makes this character so iconic is how we never get to see his face. His silhouette is enough to strike fear in our hearts, and the way he carries himself is just fear personified. In the 2003 movie, we get to see this character on screen for the first time, and Peter Jackson did everything right when it came to the portrayal of the mouth. Although we do not get to see the character in the theatrical version of the film, as we fans say, all hail the extended cut for that. In the film, the mouth of Sauron is played by Bruce Spence, who did such an amazing job at portraying the mouth by representing how hideous the fall of a man can be. 
The mouth is a tall man, roughly around the height of six foot nine. He's always seen wearing black robes that look awfully familiar to that of a priest with a black helmet, riding a horse that is just as black and looks less like a horse and more like a hideous mockery of it. The helm of his helmet has engraved words in Kirth runes. They translate into Loman Gortaur, which, when read in Sindarin, reveals it to be the voice for the dread abomination. Literally, shiver me timbers. His helmet covers most of his face, but whatever part we do get to see is enough to make it clear that he is not someone anyone should be messing with. The only thing his helmet does not cover is his mouth, and just his mouth is enough nightmare fuel for the ones with weak hearts. His lips are darkened and cracked. His teeth are diseased and decayed. It's clear that being the Herald of Sauron came with a few con. Sauron's words are so evil that even saying them out loud is enough to cause such drastic effects on the speaker. Clearly, there is no dentist or toothpaste of Sauron. However, I highly doubt if a dentist would have been able to fix the pointed yellow teeth and black gums that the mouth boasted. The mouth seems to be blind, and his voice is a very distorted and almost demonic baritone, which is very unsettling to hear. When you pair that up with his unsettling appearance, the mouth has the perfect visuals as the Herald of Sauron. What language does he speak? How can he directly speak to Sauron? The first time I heard the mouth speak, his voice was enough to unsettle me. But on later rewatches, I found myself very intrigued about what language he was communicating in. Well, it turns out, whatever he was saying was in Westron. For those who don't know, Westron was a speech that was derived from the Adonaic tongue of Numenor. It was originally a Creole language on the western coastlands of the continent of Middle-earth. When the Numenarians started establishing trade outposts in that region, the language spread from there and went far up to the east. Now, as the mouth is a black Numenorian, it comes as no surprise that he can speak in Westron. But how can he communicate with Sauron this way? Well, that is an interesting question. So, we know that in Middle-earth, we had spirits who were immaterial in nature, and we had beings with physical bodies. Now, the spirits were able to communicate telepathically, and there's a term in Quenya that refers to that. That term is Osanwe, which means the communication of thought. Now, people with physical bodies could not do that, apart from the powerful elves, such as Galadriel, for instance, who has done so multiple times. So the rest stuck to their Westron tongue. For the Valar, who could easily use Osanwe as their natural mode of speech, often preferred to speak vocally like the rest of the inhabitants when they took a physical form and interacted with the world. So when it comes to Sauron, who was a Maya himself, he had the power of Osanwe to communicate with the mouth easily. As Osanwe requires a willing participant, and we know that the mouth is a very loyal slave to his master's will, Sauron using Osanwe would not be weird at all. But then again, given that Sauron could make a physical form for himself, like the time he pretended to be the Lord of Gifts, it won't be too far out of reach to think that he knows more than one language. So he could very well communicate with his mouth vocally, using Westron speech like everyone else. But regardless of the language, we know one thing for certain most of the time. It had to have been Sauron who initiated these communications because the mouth himself is a mortal man, and he would not be capable of using Osanwe by himself. And as a loyal servant, I don't think he would go up to Sauron himself and start chattering away. Given that Tolkien had never specified a particular distance as being a barrier to Asanwe, as long as Sauron could perceive the other person and target them, he could very well communicate with them that way. Although another possible alternative way for communication would be the black speech itself. It wouldn't really be surprising if the mouth was fairly proficient in the official language of Mordor, given that he had been in the Dark Lord's tutelage for so many years. Besides, as a sorcerer and follower of Morgoth's ancient cult, it seems only natural that the mouth would be fluent in the language in which the One Ring's inscriptions were actually written in. Does he know sorcery? Well, given that he started off as a black Numenorian who was at the time worshipping Morgoth quite a bit, it's very evident that the mouth was not new to the dark arts. However, once he joined the ranks of Sauron and ended up in his favorable eyes, the mouth was diligently taught the art of sorcery to ensure he could carry out Sauron's harmful biddings with ease. So yes, he does know sorcery, and eventually he became quite the powerful dark sorcerer. What are the other versions of him? Even though in our eyes, the mouth of Sauron might be the only and most iconic version of him, there are other versions of him present when we consider the original drafts of chapters and notes of Tolkien himself. 
For example, in the earlier version of the chapter titled The Black Gate Opens, the Mouth of Sauron was supposed to have a different title. He was supposed to have the title of Lieutenant of Morgul, but later Tolkien changed it to the Lieutenant of Barad-dûr and then finalized him as the Lieutenant of the Tower. But despite these changes, Tolkien did use the title of Lieutenant of Barad-dûr to refer to the mouth in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Christopher Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's son, later explained that the title of Lieutenant of Morgul could have been a slip on Tolkien's part because there is another lieutenant who goes by that title who served Sauron as well. In Tolkien's other notes, we get quite the background history for the mouth. As we know, originally we do not get to learn a lot of his history as it's explained away with most people, including him forgetting about his life before serving the Dark Lord just to show how long it's been. In his notes, Tolkien first imagined the mouth of Sauron to be a man who was captured by the forces when he was young. As he was cunning, he managed to capture the Dark Lord's eyes, and that led to his eventual rise in power and the mouth swearing his services to the Dark Lord. Lord. However, Tolkien later rejected this version. He rewrote the mouth's history, and this time around, he was a young man named Mordu who was born in a noble house of men in Gondor. Mordu quickly became enamored of evil knowledge, and when Sauron rose to power, he chose to become a renegade and joined the service of Dark Tower. In this version, the mouth of Sauron won the Dark Lord's favor because of his servility and the fertile cruelty of his mind, along with his cunning nature. The term Mordu is a Noldoran name that means Black Knight, which sort of gives away the path this character would have eventually undertaken. So I guess that's why Tolkien left it up to our imagination how this character ended up becoming this way. Mouth of Sauron's fate. Is he immortal? Whether the Mouth of Sauron is immortal or not is a big question. Sure, in the movie we see him get beheaded, but in the books that was not quite the case. On March 25th of 3019, the Mouth of Sauron led his very own black harnessed soldiery from the Black Gate to meet with the captains of the West. When Aragorn II claimed his kingship, the Mouth dismissed his claim and instead wanted to know who among his men had the authority to communicate and strike a treaty with him. Aragorn did not say anything and held a steely gaze with the Mouth, unperturbed by his demonic appearance, which eventually scared the Mouth to an extent. So the Mouth cried out that he was an ambassador and he was here to negotiate. It would be unwise and unethical to attack him. Gandalf pulled through here and assured the Mouth that he would not be harmed in any way. But Gandalf made sure the Mouth knew that he was going to share the same fate that every other Sauron servant shared. Thanks to this, the Mouth decided that Gandalf would be the delegate and started talking with him. The Mouth mentioned that he had some things with him that he was tasked to show. What were those things? They were the Samwise Gamgee's barrow blade, Frodo Baggins' mithril coat, and an elven brooch that held together their grey cloak. It was clear that the Mouth was showing these things to show that Frodo was in their hands and they had the upper hand. Gandalf suspected Caprice in this power play, but he also knew that there was a bit of bluffing happening here. Because if the ring that Frodo had with him was in Sauron's hands, Sauron would not have sent his mouth to parley. He would be out there conquering the land. So obviously, the ring was not in the Dark Lord's hands. But Peregrine was devastated seeing his friend's thing, and while Gandalf tried to calm him down, the mouth thanked him for confirming that they knew who the tokens were from. So now Gandalf asked the million dollar question. He asked the mouth why he brought these things to the parley. The Mouth replied that the tokens were connected together and had a mark of conspiracy, which Sauron knew as well. The Mouth pretended to ponder if the spy was dear to Gandalf and asked the captains to decide amongst themselves if the spy would live or die. The Mouth promised that he would make sure the spy went through several years of slow torture, and he enjoyed the horror and fear in the captain's eyes as he described how he would break the spies in question. Once he ensured that every captain knew that his intentions with the spy had horrified them, the Mouth came to the meat of the discussion. He said that he would let the spy go free if the captains agreed to Sauron's terms. These terms effectively ensured that Sauron would get control of land across the east of the river Anduin and that the contract would last forever. No one was allowed to assail Sauron the Great in arms, secretively or openly. On top of that, the land between the Misty Mountains and the river would become tributary to Mordor, and while Sauron would kindly allow the people to govern their own affairs, they would have to aid the building of Isengard, which was destroyed at this point in the story. Once the Isengard was rebuilt, it would belong to 
Sauron and his trusted lieutenant, referring to the Mouth himself. Gandalf heard everything the Mouth had to say and realized that if this went well, the Mouth would also get to reach his aspirations. Clearly, he was doing this because he had things to gain. So Gandalf mentioned how everything that the Mouth just asked for was a bit too much for one servant. He also made it clear that he did not believe for one moment that Sauron would actually keep his word, given that Sauron is the base master of treachery. So before the captains of the West even considered the terms, it would be best if the prisoner was brought in front of them so that they could confirm the prisoner's safety and well-being. The Mouth found it funny and laughed in response. He said that the terms were not here to be negotiated. Either the captains were to accept them as is, or they were to reject them. Hearing this, Gandalf decided to no longer waste his breath by trying to communicate with the mouth. He raised his hand, and a white light blinded the mouth. Using that as a distraction, Gandalf took the cloak, sword, and mithril coat and rejected Sauron's terms. He announced that they were not here to bargain with Sauron or his slaves, and their death was near. This scared the mouth of Sauron. He decided to retreat to Sirdith Gorgor, and on his way back, right before reaching the gates, his soldiers blew on their horns. This signaled the Dark Lord to activate his trap, and we know what happened next. The fate of the Mouth of Sauron is not something that's explicitly confirmed in the novel. It is possible that he died during the Battle of the Black Gate, as the battle began even before they reached the gate. However, by chance, if he had survived that battle and the eventual downfall of Sauron, it's assumed that he may have led the fleeing force of Mordor from the battlefield after the free peoples of the world won the war. Mouth of Sauron's Role in Different Adaptations For fans of this villainous character, there are actually quite a few adaptations where he's shown up. For example, the Mouth of Sauron showed up in the 1980 animated film known as The Return of the King. He shows up briefly in a shortened version of his scene from the novel. He introduces himself, mocks Aragorn, and then gets refuted by Aragorn with no help from Gandalf. He was portrayed here by Don Messick, who was the voice behind Theoden and an Easterling captain in the movie. He also appeared in the radio adaptations done by The Mind's Eye and the BBC in 1979 and 1981, respectively. In The Mind's Eye version, he was voiced by John Vickery, and here his role was pretty similar to that in the novel. In the BBC version, where he was played by John Rye, the mouth of Sauron was given an extended role and is shown torturing Gollum. After that, we obviously have the iconic version of him in the 2003 Lord of the Rings Return of the King, which we've already discussed before. But did you know that you get to see the mouth of Sauron in many, many video game adaptations of Lord of the Rings? The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, welcomed the Mouth again. Here, the Mouth of Sauron shows up as a boss on the level of Black Gate. Here, he's voiced by Roger L. Jackson and duels with Aragorn before the host of Mordor shows up. This is very similar to the Lord of the Rings Aragorn's quest, where the Mouth of Sauron yet again duels with Aragorn until four orcs show up to help him. In the Lord of the Rings The Battle for Middle-earth 2, Roger L. Jackson reprised his role as Mouth of Sauron, who is also the Lord of Dol Guldur. Here, he played the role of the primary commander of Mordor during the northern Middle-earth conquests. He carried out his master's orders very brutally, and he conquered many elven and dwarven realms rather easily. He showed up in Lothlorien, Michigan, Mission 1, Mirkwood Mission 5, Withered Heath Mission 6, Erebor Mission 7, and then in Rivendell Mission 8. I won't spoil the gameplay for gamers, as it's an experience that you have to play out and cherish for yourselves. As for the good campaign, here the Mouth showed up to lead a small Mordor army with orcs, attack trolls, and ring wraiths. However, the Dwarven Phalanx Battalions and the Men of Dale knew of the attack and managed to slay everyone, including the Mouth. The Lord of the Rings The Third Age is another game where the Mouth of Sauron shows up as one of the three evil commanders that we can choose to play. Here, if you choose the Mouth of Sauron, you get a decent number of command points, and after his upgrades, he's a devastating warrior with a base 10 damage. This is something only the Mouth and Sauron himself share in the game. No hero even comes close to this. When it comes to the Lord of the Rings Conquest, the Mouth of Sauron is a mage-type hero. He's usually in the good campaign, and you can play him in the evil campaign, as well as skirmish modes. Then you have the Lord of the Rings Online, where the Mouth of Sauron is a Geruziel, one of Sauron's many mortal servants who he turned ageless through dark arts. But unlike the Wraiths, these Geruziels remain bound to their physical body, and hence can be killed. 
The mouth of Sauron shows up during the level Blackgate in a very similar fashion to the novel, but he survives the fall of his master. He renamed himself Dunglabath, Sauron's heir, and sent an emissary to strike a treaty with King Elisar. Though his offer was rejected, it made it clear that he was quite powerful and influential even at this point. He eventually married Lareth, the stained Sauron chief poisoner, but this ended up becoming the reason for his demise because she did not want someone as unworthy as the Mouth to carry forward their master's legacy, especially given that the Mouth played a crucial role in Sauron's fall. She poisoned him as a power move and rose in power, and eventually the Mouth gets killed off by the player. Marvelous Verdict the mouth of Sauron may not have a lot of information about him, but I believe that's what makes him so scary. He's cunning, conniving, and cruel, all the things that made him the Dark Lord's favorite and made him so fearsome. He is an iconic villain, and his presence makes Sauron even scarier. So what do you like the most about this fearsome villain? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.